Hello, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of A, a BJJ, BJJ Marriage. Marriage, where we talk about our lives as a married jujitsu couple. Still don't know why you do that. Here we are. <laughs> Boss. No. <laughs> <laughs> we're not doing wow. okay so our friends just told us yesterday they're like you need to add something in every episode that you say like every time and i was like oh and we're, nick and i were just like no <laughs> we're not doing that i think the you know talking about us oh, right so i think the the original enunciation of it was like oso or something like that I yeah can't remember oh. Osu. Or, yeah, yeah. something like that is it yep. from japan yeah the, okay. well there was a there was, it was kind of a battle cry it was huh. a preparation of things uh. Interesting. Well, welcome, well, guys. Welcome to, to an episode of BJJ Marriage. Yeah, episode 57. Yes. So that's crazy. But Exciting. Got your hosts, Nick Lee, Brittany Lee, and our special guest today, Jason Bergman. Not special. But you are special. He is special. Guesting. That's special in most, so many ways. We'll call, it, we'll call it guesting, right? <laughs> yeah. But, but yeah, thanks for guesting. coming today. Yeah, no problem. Appreciate that's it. Jason is one of our awesome brown belts at fluid jiu-jitsu mm-hmm. i've yeah. learned uh he's also say awesome we'll just say experienced <laughs> fantastic wrestler yes um again experienced and fantastic <laughs> compared to regular <laughs> wrestling and jiu-jitsu <laughs> fantastic wrestling no i've learned a lot from jason about um jiu-jitsu about wrestling about like warrior's mindset mm-hmm. these pants i'm wearing jason uh gave to me oh those are one of the pair yeah <laughs> yeah okay. i blew through Two pairs of pants with this gi top, and this is the second one that he gave to me. Dude, what is going on with you? I don't. I don't know too much happen? wrestling from you, I guess. Wow. <laughs> Look at his white gi, though. He just told me, he's like, I need a new white gi. Both of mine are shredding. So I have, yeah. I have never worn through any of my gis, and I, maybe I'm doing something wrong. <laughs> <laughs> or maybe Nick know. is doing something wrong. You know, it's, it's we're like, doing the like right cauliflower thing. ear, too. Like, I've never gotten cauliflower ear in my life. Mm. That's surprising with wrestling in your background. But I always wore headgear, too. So mm. yeah, That makes yeah. sense. That'll do it. Yeah. But But yes, welcome to the episode, Jason. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, so we have been with Jason. You've been at Fluid the entire time Nick has been at Fluid, right? Yeah, so I was Mm -hmm. was one of the the first, if you will. Yeah. Um, Blue Belt? When was that? Uh, Yeah, Blue Belt. Okay. Was that five, six years ago? Yeah. Do you remember when you started that? At least five years ago. In the basement, yeah. Yeah, I know you're in the basement photos. Yeah, Yeah, it was one of the the first, if you will. Um, Yeah, it was, uh, you know, for me at that time... Uh, there were some tumultuous things going on and, and, you know, there's, you know, you talk about the, you know, some of the drama in, in, in the Brazilian jiu-jitsu world and, and challenges and, you know, I've experienced a number of that. I'm not the only one. So, I, you know, it's, it's just kind of rooted in, in, I think in gyms in general, right? And cronyism mm-hmm. and uh, cult facets Culture. of things mm-hmm. and. You know, the, I'm not going to go into the names because I'm not. I don't like name dropping, and I yeah. don't like hurting people. Right? <laughs> For that's, sure. that's not something I do. But the, you know, the gym that I'd come from, you know, they had lost their black belt, or their, you know, their, the, the there were some conditions. I'll say where the the black belt was no longer there, and and really to accelerate yourself as a gym, you need that type of leadership. You need that kind of experience. Just you know, a, in my mind, a purple belt is not a. Um, is in today's day and age is is not like school ownership worthy right at least mm-hmm. that, that was my mindset maybe i'm wrong and, and that's fine maybe you know and, and maybe 25 years ago right when when there when brazilian jiu-jitsu was not as flush as it is today i could see that right mm-hmm. yeah because there wasn't the opportunity um so i was i was adamant of getting that type of exposure and continued learning with with a black belt and um, the school owner was not happy with some of the um, with me going and venturing out in that regard, mm. and uh, he said no mas, and uh, you know I I don't really um, you know uh, converse with or associate with that gym anymore, and and likewise you know vice versa also. Because there's hardships, right? There, you know, yeah. and, and for me, it was it, I, I had no ill intentions. I really didn't. I was trying, you know, I was trying to get proper learning and proper training from the proper source. Yeah, that's fair. And uh, well, black belt. you know, people right. people just didn't see it that way. And uh, you know, everyone has, is entitled to their own perceptions and rights. I really don't like 
you know, as I've gotten older, um, I'm trying less and less, especially with what we've gone through in the past two years, I'm trying less and less to impose myself on other people. I don't think it's right. I really don't think it's right. Mm -hmm. And I've done that. I've I've had experience with people doing that to me in in multiple areas. You know, this was one incident, incident. Um, Another incident where maybe I'll get a little bit more name droppy is, um, you know, in traditional jiu-jitsu, you know, as you all know, I trained in traditional jiu-jitsu for a long time. And that would be to Japanese jiu-jitsu? Japanese jiu-jitsu. So, you know, and, and it's interesting, too, because Thaddeus is, has experienced some yeah. of the same thing that I've gone through. And, you know, and Thaddeus, anybody that knows Thaddeus, I mean, Thaddeus is golden. You know, he's a golden <laughs> human being. He really and is. to treat, a, treat an individual like that, the way that we had been treated... It really does not speak well for, in my mind, you know, some of the traditions of Japan. And, you know, if you want to get into some of the traditions of Japan and the shortcomings, we, we can do a whole episode on that. <laughs> I'm sure. You know, their honor is skin deep. Okay. Literally. Their honor is skin deep. Okay. And there is, there is no depth or hold in my mind, in my opinion, to their honor. From what you've experienced? From what I've experienced, not only just from the traditional jiu-jitsu and martial arts world, but also from the working environment. I've worked with Japanese you know, oh. engineers uh, on a daily basis. So you've just been immersed in the I've culture. Been in, I've been immersed in, in a Japanese culture. Okay. Hmm. Um, regardless, you know, they're no better or worse than any anybody else, you know, um, regardless. You know, so w- what happened there? Um, you know, the 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 grandmaster of the system or the organization that I was a part of was not happy with the fact that I was training in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. Even though the, the, the gentleman that was teaching me, who even was a member of Fluid at a period over a period of time, um, knew about it. And, uh, you know, for whatever reason, he didn't clear it with the grandmaster or didn't make it, you know, known or whatever. So there mm-hmm. was a time and I was, I was actually training in knife fighting at NBC in uh in um Colorado during this time <laughs> and uh with Michael Jennings who is who is or Michael Janet's I'm sorry um who is uh, absolutely f- phenomenal um I've seen you with that fake knife it's scary yeah <laughs> um and and Jason's also during, scary though <laughs> yeah, I try not to be I, mean, I try not to be but I try to be at some point and, and to some level for a <laughs> yeah. reason we can get into that a little bit more <laughs> in, in later but um, so what happened was, you know, the grandmaster via email, right, basically oh. said, you have to make a choice. You have to choice. You, you cannot train in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu anymore. So either you quit Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu or you're or we are going to. And this is how the Japanese are. We will respectfully ask you to resign hmm. from Japanese. Jiu-Jitsu. They won't kick you out. They'll respectfully ask you to resign uh. to try and cover themselves. Right. It's it, and it's it's kind of an awkward thing. Kind of like you know? making someone's life miserable at a job so you don't have to pay them unemployment and they and, quit. Yeah, kind of. <laughs> I guess you could say that. But mm-hmm. you know what would happen is if I would have not respectfully resigned and if I would have shown up for class, they just would no no longer taught and they would have said no, you you must leave. So what what what's the point, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. So I I respectfully resigned and um, I was not real happy with that situation. I even said. Um, via text and 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 this is where I get a little disheartened is um, I said you know what do I need to do what do I need to do to prove myself I've I've done everything right I've you know I've defended this system I've de- you know I've, I've mm-hmm. been a purist in all of that and a lot of even what I even talked about during that time did not go over real well in the Brazilian jiu-jitsu world even mm-hmm. though it was true but you know again it's cross parallels that you know of yes. infighting right yes yeah. um and and uh, I even said, you know, like, and I, and I kind of just off the cuff said, like, what what the hell do I need to do? Do I need to, like, challenge somebody just to prove that? <laughs> because, and here's the thing. In, in traditional jiu-jitsu, that's how it would go down. Okay. So how traditional a jiu-jitsu are you going to be when you, when you chastise someone for conducting themselves in a traditional fashion? It's an interesting question. And that's kind of what happened. Then they came back at me like, oh, he's challenging people. Well, uh, yeah. I mean, if you're a traditional jiu-jitsu and you tell yourself that way, let's, let's conduct ourselves that way then. Yeah. Kind of like alpha male in the pack or something. You know, something along those lines. Yeah. Well, I mean, and, and the thing is, is, you know, so going back to like the traditional dojo, you know, the way we line up in class in Brazilian jiu-jitsu where you have the highest rank at the door and then to the left, right? Mm-hmm. So that they did that same way in the dojo, but in in Japan, right? And the reason sure. for that is because any any contender, any challenger, 
that came in the door, there was there was no belt system back then, mm-hmm. right? Mm. There was no even gi. They kind of wore clothes. They just wore clothes, yeah. right? Yeah. They didn't even have colored clothes depending on rank. It was just, you know, you had your clothes on. Sure. Now, it was the identify, you identified the top students by the student that stood closest to the door. Mm-hmm. Okay. And any challenger that came in did not challenge or take on the the owner of the dojo or the, the sensei or the grandmaster or the soke as called. Mm. They took on the top student. Sure. And that's just the way it went. You could tell the top student by the first person in line. Mm-hmm. So what's the purpose of challenging other gyms? Just challenge yourself or just to uh, take over the gym? Just <laughs> and that's just it. Like challenging and, and, and fighting was not new. It's not it was very common. Um, even even in swords, you know, you talk about uh, um, Miramoto. I mean, he he did he took on a lot of challengers. Now he he dropped the sword um, early on in his life and basically just took on challenges with a, a what, what's called well it wasn't really a boken, but it was basically a, a wooden rendition of a sword. So he he literally fought basically I think it was like from his thirties on with a wooden stick. Wow. Mm-hmm. I mean, he was very young when he dropped an actual sword. That's crazy. Um, even the very famous fight he had on the island was with a, a carved out um, a paddle. Yeah. Hmm. So. Lots of backstory on that. That's <laughs> but you yeah. know, even even so, yeah. One one very interesting secret to the traditional systems, you know, and I'm I'm getting less and less apt to hide some of the secrets because t- enough time has gone past. But in. Uh, so there's there's some traditional systems. You know, one of the systems I learned under was called Takagi Yoshinru, and uh, it's it's a very very good, very strong system. It's one of the traditional samurai systems. And then okay. there's also another system called Kukushinru, which is I, I think some of you have, have heard me mention. And Kukushinru is a very destructive, um, a very powerful system. You know, it's um, all your strike, all your blocks are strikes. Everything defensive is offensive. It's a very okay. cool system. Now, interesting, about that. I do the, the interesting thing about that is both the grandmasters of those systems at one point fought. Okay. Okay. You know, lo and behold, yeah, they did fight, mm-hmm. right? Because they wanted to find out what system was the best. Mm-hmm. Sure. And they both came to an agreement that the Kukushin Ru system had the better weapons and bow system, and the Takagi Yoshin Ru system had the best unarmed combative style. Sure. So they both kind of combined, and they both came to an agreement that you could never reach the rank of Menkyo Kaidan, which is the highest rank that you can get. You could never reach the rank of Menkyo Kaidan in either of those systems unless you had Menkyo rank in both. In both. Hmm. Interesting. Well, so, so how old were you when you started in Japanese Jiu-Jitsu then? I was in my early 30s. Okay. Yeah. Oh. So well, that was in, in, in those systems. Like I did... Um, you know, I did Aikido and Karate when I was very young. Um, you know, I, and, and this is where I, I was very challenged with, with Karate because um, I was, I don't even know what rank I was. I wasn't a very high rank. But, you know, when you get to a certain rank, you're allowed to spar. And you'll spar mm-hmm. with, like, the bra- black belts and stuff. And there was a very, I'll just say, a rambunctious black belt that liked to impose his his belt on people. I'll just say mm. it that way. Sure. And I, and I sparred with this dude. And I, here, I'm in high school, right? Yeah. And I'm in shape. Like, yeah. I'm a wrestler. I'm in shape. Like, I can take a hit and I can give it. You know, I'm and in you can shape. Bounce. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know, when I was in high school, you know, 17 years old, I had a uh, 3.5% body fat. Jesus. Okay? Yeah. I was... I had no fat on me. It was pure oh. muscle. So 100, 140 pounds of pure freaking muscle. Yep. And and uh, here this guy, he's 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 going to impose his black belt authority on me. And he he clocked me a couple of times. And I, and I after a, a number of times of experiencing this through sparring sessions, I took it to him, dropped his ass to the ground, and basically handled him. Sure. Probably deserved. And and I'm thinking to myself. <laughs> If that's all it takes to beat this dude at my, uh, with who I am, how good is this system? Right. Right? How good is this really? Okay. Um, that's a good question. And in, in karate, there, karate is not bad. Okay? It is not bad. It is It is very good. I do get a little cautious with systems that that cater to the, the 
the kata of things, right? And so you have your forms. And the forms are good for practice and whatnot. Yeah. But until you get into the reality of the matter, all of what you have learned does not matter. Mm -hmm. So that's where Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, and in some sense what Judo used to be, not so much anymore, but what Judo used to be with their wazas and, and whatnot. Mm -hmm. um, if, if you've never been put in those situations, when you're put in those situations, you're not going to know what to do. Or how your body reacts. Or how or your how body you're reacts, how your mental, what your mental state is actually. So for me, yes. it was, I took it to this guy. He didn't know how to respond, even when I had him locked down, and he was done. If that would have been re a reality of a, if that would have been the reality of the matter, or a regardless of what his belt was, he would have been dead mm -hmm. in the streets at a black belt. <laughs> yeah, that's crazy. I mean, come on, man. Yeah. So a lot of people can a lot of people can say whatever they want to say about Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, and there's there, you know there's certain things about Brazilian Jiu Jitsu also that I kind of go, nah, come on, guys. But I you know, I've yeah. been trying to keep my mouth shut more as time goes on. But I look at it this way. Right, you have Jocko, right? Who's yeah, who's a Navy SEAL commander. Mm -hmm. If that guy can give the checkbox of Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, who the f am I to 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 say no? Right, right. If Chuck Norris, who there's a very famous footage that you probably have all seen where Chuck Norris did a little fight with with Hicks and Gracie, and mm -hmm. Hicks and Gracie just took it to him like it was like it's nothing. Yeah, mm -hmm. and then Granted, he brought Hicks in and the whole crew to his dojo and yep. had them mm -hmm. all. Yep. Spar them, yeah. Yep. As Hickson does. <laughs> but I mean, granted, I really don't like talking about Hicks and Gracie because Hicks and Gracie is an anomaly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. Hicks and Gracie in any system would do well. Yeah. Right? Okay, so let's be careful in 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 that. Right. With that being said, you know the first UFC. The reason why they I don't know if you get, anybody knows this, but the reason why they put Hoist Gracie in the in the, I think Joe Rogan talks about this. The reason mm -hmm. they put Hoist Gracie in there in the first UFC was because he is the weakest of them all. Yes. Mm -hmm. And if he is able to be as good as he was, mm -hmm. and that says a lot. Mm -hmm. And they had Hicks in there as a backup just right. in case things went bad. Yeah. Yeah. They're like, all right. And Master Sauer was there. going to bring this guy out. Yeah, Sauer was there. Yep. <laughs> They're going to bring out the big guns, right? Yes. You're, okay, well, this isn't going well. <laughs> Handle this now. <laughs> exactly. Okay, let's show him what it's really like. Right. Not to say, take anything away from Hoist. Right. I don't think I knew that they did that because he was the weakest, though. Yeah, yeah. And so I thought Hoist they were was, just like, put a Gracie in there. He was 170 pounds, so I met Hoist a couple of times. He's a, I think he's like a half inch or maybe an inch taller than me. Okay. But he was like, a, he was 170 pounds. So basically, he's my size because mm -hmm. I'm, I'm 170 pounds right now. So my height, That's my size, to, yeah. you know, he might, I think he, he's a little bit thicker in the hips, not much thicker, but, you know, he might have like a two inch more on his waist sure. than I do. Which there there are advantages to that, right? But he he wasn't a big guy, and here he's taking on monsters, yeah, like two hundred fifty pounds, two hundred twenty five right? pound muscles, right, mm -hmm. right. And you know, and and as you know, back then too, I and mean, the the rules were were limited. I think eye gouging wasn't allowed, and kicking in the <laughs> groin wasn't allowed. Yeah, just so those just are the only it. two group. Only two rules. Yeah, mm -hmm. Brett is always talking about the fish hooks in the mouth and yeah. things. And I was like, well, what? Th there's a, there is a fight <laughs> that Hoist is in uh, with that big guy. I forgot his name. But he, he's pulling the guy's hair like the oh, whole gosh. time. Yeah. But um, you wear whatever you want. I, I kind of <laughs> wish in some regards they would go back to that. And, Th only yes. those two rules. Um, but, you know, it is what it is. It's turned a little bit more into a sport. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you, we... We tell the warrior connotation, right? And I, I get a little challenged with the, the, the warrior connotation. <laughs> and, you know, myself coming from a military family, uh, military family, it's funny too. So I, my, my uh, aunt, she just passed away. She was, um, she was a soldier. She just passed away of, can uh, well, of COVID. She passed away in December of COVID, but she had kidney complications that added on to that, right? But she was, she was a soldier. She was one of those soldiers with all the ribbons on her chest that would be in parades, you know? Mm -hmm. Sure. Um, my uncle, um, he was a two-time, uh, two-tour vet in Vietnam in the, in the Marine Corps. My dad was in, in, in Vietnam. Um, there's stories of my great-grandfather in World War One. You know, there's members of my family that were in the Civil War. We're still trying to wow. find out if there are actually members of my family that were in the Revolutionary War or not. Wow. We, we haven't, we have not found out 
whether because things get lost over yeah. time, right? But we do. I do know there are family members that were in the Civil War. So that's so my, crazy. My family is. <laughs> that's why it's so hard to hold you down. <laughs> my my family has fought in every major war since the Civil War we know of. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, I have another uncle that was in, um, except Operation Freedom. I don't think anyone's been in Operation Freedom, but my my uh, was the the Iraqi War in the, in the nineties. I I had uncles that were over there for that too. Okay. Um, he was a, a military police officer for the Marine Corps over there. Um, anyway, so my family's been fighting in war for a long time. I don't, I don't think of myself as a warrior, right? I, I always tell people, if you want to call yourself a warrior, if you want to give yourself that connotation, the Marine Corps is, is hiring. Sure. Right? Yeah. Um, and... So, like, I look at fluid jiu-jitsu and, and, and whatnot. You know, we do have, uh, for lack of better words, you know, we do have a warrior at Brazilian jiu- in, at fluid jiu-jitsu. His name is Mike Davis. Mm-hmm. Yes. And that dude is, he is a legit warrior. Um, not only that. not only in his capabilities, but in his mindset. Yeah. All right? And and, and I don't mean this negatively or, or, or disrespectfully to anybody, but in my mind, he is it. He, yeah. He's the only one. I can sure. see that. Right. And I, lo- I love the guy. The guy is amazing. And he really carries himself. He carries that uh, very well. Now, with that being said, I've also met Marine Marines that I really wouldn't call warriors. You know? Yeah. But that's just, you know, again, me. And I don't I don't mean to bash anybody. And I apologize if, if people No, I just think it's a very old it's, school way of thinking. Yeah. And I don't think there's anything really wrong with that. Right. So I don't think you should have to apologize for feeling justified that way because i think your description of it is completely honorable now you know that and then there's 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 the people that want to go in the cage right and i'm I'm too old to go in the cage Um, what are you looking at me for (laughs) and nick would do well i think you would do well in the cage um you know i did some more underground stuff when i was very young in seattle (laughs) which you know did not you know there was there was you got hurt. You really got hurt. Mm. Uh, yeah, know? I can only imagine. And <clears throat> so, again, going back to this warrior connotation, you know, I hear, you know, people go in the cage for whatever reason. I, and I, I personally kind of don't understand it. Like, if you want to get in a fight, if you want to get in a fight, go to a bar on the north side, <laughs> okay, at yeah. like 11 o'clock at night and yell some derogatory things. And you're yep. going to find yourself in a fight pretty quick. Yes. Now, let's see how you handle yourself Yeah. without your buddies. Yeah. Now, if you want to get in a fight, do that. Mm-hmm. Let's see how bad you are. Now, when I was a different person in my life, I used to do shit like that. <laughs> sure. Okay? So I know what's going to happen. Yeah. You've been through it. You've lived it. So don't go in the cage just to... just to be able to tout yourself as this accelerated human being, right? <laughs> Yeah. Go go in a cage for the experience of it, right? And because the there there is there is some real experience to that. That is right. That you're going to find out you know, quite a bit about yourself. Absolutely. Um, but to attach the warrior connotation to that is, uh, in my opinion, a, a leap too far. Just that makes a sense. little bit. Yeah, I mean it. It is a sporting event, mm-hmm. and there is a difference between being a warrior on the battlefield in a war or in the battlefield of protecting your land or anything like that versus somebody that's going out in combat sports where yeah. you're doing you it do, for points. Right. Where you do fight each other, yeah. but mm-hmm. it's not to the death. Yeah. I mean, my, it's just not. <laughs> my uncle is 75 years old. All right. My uncle did seven. He did seek and destroy missions in Vietnam. So basically he went about, he, he went and killed people. Wow. That was his job. Wow. He actually spent he spent time in uh, the the prison in in Saigon while he was there because he killed a marine that mouthed off to him. Oh my um, god! So he he even though he's seventy five years old right now, he he has um, he's a very mean individual. Okay, and, and on top of that, he goes out west all the time to still shoot. Uh, so he still shoots at thousand yards. You know, wow, so seventy five. He, he makes all his own ammunition. He does. You know, he, he does all his machining on his guns. He, Whoa. Yeah. He, he is he is about as extreme in destroying things as, as possible. As so these be. are the type of people I've grown up with. Yeah. <laughs> that explains so much. Right? <laughs> <laughs> and and uh. even at 75 years old, yeah, he's 75 years old. He's 
See, he's about he's about five foot seven, five foot eight, two hundred and twenty pounds. You know, very stocky. Well, I I could probably take him at because he's seventy five years old. He, but yeah. there's a good chance he could really hurt me. Yeah, he could still come out on because top. he's a mean person. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and when you don't have that filter of no, I, yeah, because I know like in competition, there's times where, and like we've done it in rolling and training, where there's times where. You can really be like violent right. in competition, but most of us don't want to. Do right. That. So he's a you know, and that's the thing. Like he's actually experienced and released that level of violence, right? So he yes. he has commendations. He was commendated for valor. He has a silver star. Um, the I think he has a silver star. Don't quote me on that. But I know he has commendations. I know for sure because yeah. my dad was just reading them. Three. He started reading them like three weeks ago. Okay. And he started to cry. He couldn't finish. Oh, okay. So this is a this is a man that um, did heroic actions under fire. Okay. There's a very for interesting the for the for the country. There's a very interesting story, um, a, a, a famous family story with him where. The fire line was broke or whatever, and he's in one of those bunker pits with you know manning a manning a fifty cal machine gun, and he's got mates or you know, another person in in the bunker with him, and they get overrun. They run out of ammo, they get overrun. Everyone in in the pit gets killed except for him, and he's getting overrun by Viet Cong, and he's in the hand to hand combat at this point. He kills wow. he kills a half a dozen of these guys and buries himself underneath all six of them and lays. Wow. Still it's, goes in, and stays overnight with these six dead bodies on top of them. Oh my goodness! It's so like things he, you only read about in history books. Like, so this is, this is so this is a man that has released um, what he had to do to survive. He has released that um, violence. I mean, to kick to kill six human beings with your bare hands. So, I mean, so there are some yeah. real warriors out there in the world. Yeah, definitely. You know? And and they're you know and they're not necessarily the people that have shot people from a thousand yards. Those those guys are very good at what they do. There are some real warriors out there that have just destructively torn people apart. Mm-hmm. And and those are scary people. Those yeah. are scary people. And I hope to never have to fight against them yeah. <laughs> because I know uh, I've never had to release anything near that out of myself. Yeah. Well, that's one of the biggest things that people say is like, just because I know jujitsu doesn't mean I ever want to have to use it. Yeah. I mean, you know, when I was younger, you know, so I, I you know, I, I don't know how much time. Where are we at? We're fine. Yeah. You know, I, I, I grew up, uh, how much are we in? We're in 27. 27? So okay. Okay. There we are. So, <laughs> you know, I, I grew up pretty demonstratively in, in my life. Um, you know, I, you know, if you can imagine, so. I don't know if you guys can think of or can even acknowledge or even understand the history of like the social services systems in like the eighties, like okay. in the eighties, like in the social services systems in, in, well, probably the whole country, but certainly the state of Wisconsin was a goddamn joke. Yeah. Okay. Well, I mean, right? it still Where is. So it, you can it only imagine a, how much worse it was 40 years ago. It still is got a long way to go before yeah. it's better. But, you know, even in the eighties, like women were put up on this pedestal and women could do no wrong to... To have your children, you know, to take children away from their mother was an impossibility. Mm-hmm. Oh, okay, just did not happen. Yeah, the mom always went in court, and I don't oh, think that started changing until like what ten years ago. I mean, it, it, it's still even very tough. Yeah, it's still even very tough. So if you can imagine, I was taken away from my my sister and I were taken away from my mother when I was eight. Wow. Okay. okay. So I'm not going to go into the details of all the shit that we went through, but sure. my, my mom and dad divorced when I was four. I think I, I think it was four. Okay. Okay. And just imagine, so in 1986, here I'm taken away from my my mother. Right? My dad is who knows where at this point. Okay. I think he, he well, no, he remarried in 1984 it was. <clears throat> so sure. we, we went into foster care. Okay. All right. Luckily, my sister and I were together, but, you know, I didn't like the environment, so I left. I took off. Oh. I was eight. I, le- I ran away. Sure. So, you know, here I'm eight years old. I'm stealing from people. I'm stealing shit from stores. I'm, you know, living in the survive. bathrooms. I'm, yeah. you know, I was trying to, you know, just trying to eat and survive. I did this for about three months as eight. Okay? Wow. And you think about this because my daughter is eight now. To think mm-hmm. that she could actually live out in the streets and, and handle herself at eight years old. 
That's insane. It, it, it's insane for me to think that, holy shit, like, I, is act, I actually did this. Somehow, All she yes. has to do, though, is just grab someone's hair and she's good. <laughs> <laughs> she did that to me. So, <laughs> <laughs> Amelia literally grabbed my ponytail yeah. and, like, ripped my head to the ground when we were rolling. I'm like, okay. <laughs> she's she's a powerful little yeah. girl. I mean, but yeah. not, you know, and that's the thing. She's powerful, but not powerful enough still to handle an adult. Right. Right. Know? Right. Um, so anyway, um, so yeah, eight years old. Finally, they, they like find me, right? And um, <laughs> and then my father and his new wife, who turned into my stepmother, got custody of me, full custody of me when I was about eight. Okay. So this is later in the fall because I was, see, I think because my birthday is in July, so I think I just turned eight. They got custody in in like September. I started a new school, Edgewood, in first grade. Yeah, you know, like I had already gone through first grade and failed. Oh, okay. So like I failed first grade because you know, Fussing. just imagine the yeah. environment I was right. in. Right. You're in no structure. Yeah. So then you know, from the time I was eight years old to twelve years old, um, my, my we still had to my mom still had visitation rights, right? So yeah. my sister and I we still had weekends and stuff that we go over there, and it was it, the environment hadn't changed. Right. Okay. So every other weekend and, and it was just it was like horrible. There's a, there's a reason you got taken away from your mom. It was mom horrible those times. with, with yeah. some of the shit we went. So she lost full custody of us when I was when I was um, I think twelve. I think I was twelve. So literally, you know, I, I I lost my mother when I was twelve. Okay. In 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 in, in more ways than just one. I'll just leave it at that. Yeah. And so just you know. Those first twelve years of a person's life, just to imagine, you know, very I formative, very, very, they're pivotal in 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 what creates a human being, right? Yeah. So even before I was twelve, my stepmother, um, her brother, who was my uncle, um, he was a wrestler. He wrestled at Cudahy High School, and okay. there were, you know, I was I was challenged during that period of time. You could only imagine, you know, I was I was doing bad shit we'll just leave it at that sure and so she s- figured i needed some level of outlet or guidance or focus so uh she got me involved in wrestling right and then yeah. my uncle um kind of helped out a little bit and i was part of a club and it was going okay and then <clears throat> that went for about a year i think it was two years i did that and then in sixth grade um Sixth grade uh, was the first year the Greenfield School District started a wrestling program in the, at the sixth grade level, and I was the first one to do it. And, and our oh. coach was um, Kevin Morin, who is, for those of you who know, that's um, Matt Morin's uncle. Oh. So I've been coached by Kevin Morin, Kent Morin, and Matt Morin's father, so all three of them. I've heard of Matt Morin, never met him, but we're invited at... Free form open match, I know that. Yeah. Yeah, I think we have like an open invitation to go. He he's he's a very I mean you can only imagine the family he came from. He's an amazing grappler. Yeah. I mean his father was the coach at MSUE for a number of years. His father was actually he wrestled at Marquette, I think it was. Okay. His brother Kevin wrestled at uh, Lacrosse, I think it was. And I can't I think Kent wrestled at Marquette also. I can't remember. Anyway. So he comes from that <laughs> he comes from that lineage. Right? Yeah. So he's very good. So yeah, so I you know sixth grade I joined that did that seventh grade eighth grade all through high wrestling, school yeah. just just wrestling and I wish I would and, have wrestled in high school mm-hmm. and you know and it's it it's 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 such an amazing thing to to be a wrestler the the body the just the level of control you have to have of your body yeah a, a, as a whole right and that's kind of one of the unique aspects of I'll just call it grappling because it it, it, tra- it transitions into other grappling arts too is is the weight classes right yeah yes. could you imagine if you had uh swimming where the swimmers were required to you know nope you, you have to be 170 pounds right oh my god it, it would be, it a, whole, it'd be a whole different world yep. yeah swimming would be a whole different world or if mm-hmm. you had football teams where okay your whole offensive line can weigh no more than 2,000 pounds right okay yes right it would be a whole different world and it's a whole different aspect to the sport that no other sport has that yeah. makes it that much more difficult yeah, separated by body types that. in general. Yeah. It, well, it, even just the 500 pound limit for that primal fight. Yeah, team, yeah, team right. grappling. Yeah. Right. Nick was trying to figure out if he did it, like, who could he take with? And he was like, Bergman and your dad. <laughs> We'd make 500 pounds. <laughs> maybe. <laughs> if we both, if you and I both cut weight, maybe. <laughs> well, your dad is two, 200, right? Right. Uh, so we'd have to both yeah. be like 150. 
And that would be really tough for me. Well, he would cut. He'd probably go down to like. So we need to be three. Yeah, we need yeah three hundred. So I could I could get down to one fifty five. Right, but well, I'm at well, one sixty five. Would it be with really or without a gi me. though? With a, <laughs> without I, without a gi, I mean without a gi, I, I mean it might even be tough for me to go to one fifty five without right. a gi. It's getting harder for me to cut weight nowadays. It really is. <laughs> um, anyway, but but that's because I also like to drink beer. So. <laughs> um, I was actually well, going to I was gonna bring some beers with me because oh. I I haven't started drinking yet. That comes in a couple hours. Yeah, <laughs> but uh, yeah. So I mean, you know. During that period of time, you know, it's all the the wrestling and and dude, I you know, so the where my first level of confidence came and and my first level of acknowledgement of this thing that's called grappling came in in sixth grade because the like the toughest kid in school, his name was Joel Williams. He was like one of the toughest kids in school. He also joined up in the program. Okay, and then towards towards the end of the season, we had kind of this intramural match or whatever, and. And I was paired up to go against him, and I'm like, sure. oh shit, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm I was not He's a very toughest dude. I was, a, I, you know, I had because of the life I grew up in, I had a lot of anxiety. I yeah. was not very sure of myself. I had a, I, I was, I was afraid all the time. I don't okay. know what, what people could understand what it is to just live in fear all the time. It, it's a, it's. I would not suggest it being a world to live in, yeah. but I had to go up against this kid, and I ended up beating him. Okay. Huh? And I had in sixth grade. I, in sixth grade, and and so I had his respect at that point. We kind of became, you know, subtle friends, if you will. Sure. But Train uh, together, help each other out, or whatever. It, but at that point, you kind of come to a realization like there's got to be something to this, right? And then you know, I got let me see my freshman year of high school. I you know, because I was a small kid, I was ninety six and a half pounds. My freshman year of high school, you get some kids that'll left with you. So I I was in soccer. And uh, there was a there was a dude that was after him with me. His name, his name was Nick Harrison. You can swear. And, it's okay. uh, what's that? You can swear. It's okay. Have I been? You no. can drop an F instead of. Oh. <laughs> the word. I am a swearer. It's I, fine. I am a swearer. Yeah, there's and, no no filters in this podcast. <laughs> no. But uh, so he and I we we were we were gonna go at it, but I I was just you know I didn't want to do it. He was a little bit, he was bigger than me and and whatnot, and I I just you know I, I didn't I didn't want to. I didn't want to get into it, right? Yeah. Well, finally, what the soccer team actually did is they got the two of us together and they created a circle around us oh, and we're like, course. "You, you two are going after." Him. Oh boy! So I did. Like I, I, <laughs> I, I took them down, got them down. You know, basically did. Um, you know, kind of what we do that drill, the spin drill. Got behind them and just started yeah. punching them in the back <laughs> of the head. You know, and yeah. Um, well, you know, kids on the football team that would try and challenge me and shit. You know. Big dudes, offensive line guys that were two hundred pounds. You Take had your own down. Gracie challenge, but it was you. <laughs> it was it was me, right? So mm-hmm. I had I never had any I never had any real fear of like getting into a, a, a fight because I I, I had this arrogance and I and I was tough and I was fit. You could beat bigger and, guys than you. you know, again, you know, later in in high school when I you know I had the incident with this black belt and karate. That yeah. school's still around, so I don't want to. I'm not going to talk about it, but. And I never even told the school instructor about it either. I just left. Sure. Right? Yeah, sometimes like, it's just better. Sometimes it's better to just leave. Walk yeah. away. Just walk away. Yeah. And, you know, so when I when I got into, you know, me and my being troublesome didn't end entirely. But I, I at least started because I had a, a good stepmother who was trying to instill some level of morality into me and, you know, yes, you, this is okay. No, this is not okay. Um, so I, I actually started to have a good foundation, but I still had this background of just like destruction. Right. Mm-hmm. Sure. So I would go and do shit. Right. And, and, you know, I, your dad actually kind of mentioned something the other, not that long ago about um, how I am unpredictable is what it was. And I okay. am. I am a very unpredictable person. So I give you guys yep. a lot of credit for bringing me on the show. <laughs> but, but a very with that, good way to define you. <laughs> but with that being said, I also under, I, I also can bring it together. I can pull it together. Mm-hmm. But there's always that underlying, like, no, we're going to blow this up. Sure. So I'd also, I'd often Built find myself. Yeah. I'd often find myself in environments where I would blow it up. Sure. Um, and I was just kind of known as this individual that you just didn't mess with. 
Sure. Right. We all still know that. Um, <laughs> it's so funny when you get brought up when you're not there too. And we're all like, oh yeah, Jason Bergman. So, you don't want to mess with him. And then I always tell the story about how you taught me to put your fist on their spine when you're inside control. <laughs> I think, you know, and that's where I try and be, you know, like I, I when I was teaching on Thursdays or whatever it was, like I tried mm-hmm. to teach some cool stuff. I think I freaked some people out when I talked mm-hmm. about, you know, because, you know, Big pe- people, regardless of their size, they all scream the same when you're going to rip their face off. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. And and Everybody I know, and I know this. All right. I, I know this. Okay. So I'm not going to get into details. Sure. But, <laughs> um, and I think that freaks some people out. I can. Yeah. So and and I don't know if we have any police officers or we're not listening, but I'll I'll go into one story and 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 that's fine. Ellie, close your ears. Um, <laughs> So uh, this is, I was in my early twenties at this point. I used to hang out with, you know, my buddies at that time. And, and one of my good friends at that time, we're not really good friends anymore because I got sick and tired of his, I am better than everybody attitude and, and sure. whatever else. Um, That's hard to live around. And, and he, he lost his father in, in, on January 25th, 1997. Okay. So if you look up that date, look up police officers that were killed in line of duty, you'll find it. Okay. Oh. So he was hit by a drunk driver, and it 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 really took. And this was a very, very, very well respected individual in the sheriff's department. Very okay. well respected. Um, he has pictures with the president. He was the he was the he was the oh. bomb dog guy. So wow. when the presidents came into town, his dog went in to search and did all this stuff. You know, he was a very okay. well respected individual. And you know, it did not go well with. It did not go over well with you know his family. If you could imagine that this man was taken away from them. Yeah, by such an yeah. act like that too. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so um, I'll never forget this. We were we were hanging out um, at uh, his cousin his cousin's house. I was about to say her name, but I'm not going. Ah. To, at his cousin's house, she had a boyfriend that we had never met before. But it was myself um, and my two buddies, and her and and her boyfriend. Mm-hmm. And this guy just decided to go off and talk shit about police officers and Oof. and you know and I have you know I. Uh-oh. I'll just I'll just say this, you know, I I respect the law enforcement a lot, and nobody's sure. nobody's perfect. I'm right. just going to say that. All right. Regardless, this guy just started to go too far, and I, I said to him, and Chris was oh shit, sorry. Um, <laughs> no, no. Uh, my buddy was sitting right across from him, and I could just I could feel the tension. Yeah. Building right, and I looked at the dude, and I was like, you know, dude, you keep your mouth shut. You you might want to shut your mouth. And he just, sure. you know, you're not going to tell me and da 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 da. Yeah, one of those. And uh, I said, you keep this up, it's going to go. I can't remember exactly what I said, but basically I said, this is going to go bad. Right. Um, it's not going to end well. There's, and I, and I pointed like this with my thumb, there's there's a block of knives on the counter back there. You're going to experience that. Oh, boy. All right. All right. And uh, <clears throat> he, he, he thought I was joking. Okay. He thought I was joking. So he, he decided to keep on going. So I got up out of the chair. I went to the counter. I took the biggest knife out of the block. And I walked over by him and I put it up against his face. And I said, if you don't shut the fuck up right now, I'm going to carve your face off. Wow. And I, and I was not fucking kidding. Yeah. That's kind of who I was. Yeah. And yeah. That, that's a light duty story of shit that I pulled. Damn. All right. So... I hope you shut up. <laughs> <laughs> he he was he was afraid at, at that point. The, yeah. the whole the whole environment changed mm-hmm. where we just kind of left after that. We're like, well, we're yeah, not having that, fun anymore. That's Let's a buzz. Yeah, yeah. It, it, you know, it was that was kind of the end of the night. <laughs> yes, <laughs> understandably so. But um, you know, I never saw him again after that. Um, Nobody ever I saw believe, him again. I, I believe <laughs> the, the two of them broke up. Um, she actually, uh, she got married to a very nice man later on in her years. Um, and I think they got kids and stuff too. So, but yeah, I mean. Was that before or after you started knife defense? That was before. Thing? That was way before. Yeah. I've, I only started really getting into um, knife defense stuff. Was that about seven years ago, seven or eight years ago? Oh, okay. Something like that. What yeah. about your swords? Uh, about the same time. Huh. Like like training wise, like I sure. would try and dabble and learn on my own, right? But, but like unless you have real a training, real, real instruction, unless you have real instruction, you're 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 pissing up a road, right. right? Which is what 
we started this whole conversation with uh, getting to the <laughs> Oh, black you want to get into the sword training, huh? <laughs> yeah. The sword training. Yeah, sword training is really cool. Um, you didn't bring your sword today. I didn't I told bring you to bring sword. your sword. <laughs> you know, again, because I'm trying to... Sh- I have a way of freaking people out. Again, okay. Right? Like, we're just, we're talking about this stuff. And even, with, like I said, when I teach class, I say things that, you know, I, I don't... It can be abrasive to some people. It, for it can sure. be it can be shockingly awful to some people, right? And it and it can be off putting. Yeah. Right. So especially in today's politically correct in, world. Yeah, especially in today's world, right? Mm-hmm. So I left my swords at home. <laughs> <laughs> I do have um, multiple swords. I don't have any that are made in Japan. I, I keep wanting to buy one, and there's a sword show down in Chicago every year. I've been meaning mm. to go down to and get one, but. Like a good traditional, like a, a, a decent traditional sword that you could use, actually use. Um, you know, it's going to cost you six, seven, eight thousand dollars. Holy cow! Yeah, I can only for, for for one that's got like, for one that's not a, um, for one that's uh, what is mm-hmm. it, uh, acknowledged by the Nahanto certificates, right? One that actually has. Um, uh, an, an inscription on it, something that has certification. Oh, yeah. Like if I'm going to buy one of these, I want it to be legit. Mm-hmm. Um, you can buy them that don't have the the forger's inscription, and mm-hmm. that's you know that is certified without the forger's inscription. You can buy one of those for like you know three, four grand. But it's those are basically those are um, those are production versions, like because their sure. swords were mass produced dur- during a period of time in mm-hmm. Japan. Even in even in the Edo period, they were producing them so fast that they didn't even spend the time to inscribe them. You know, so I you know I'd like to sure. find one that's inscribed with a, a good forger or something that has some good um, provenance to it, mm-hmm. right? Um, do you still do the sword fighting then, or training? Well, it's not. It's yeah, mm-hmm. training. Um, so I stopped two years ago because of COVID. I do okay. believe. I do believe they did start it back up. I just have not made contact with Lucas to to um, see if he's. I think he is doing it. Um, I just haven't. I just haven't done it. Again, sure. Right. So that system was Mugai Ryu, and it's. I was pleasantly surprised and impressed. Right, because um, when I when I was asked to respectfully leave the traditional jujitsu, the one thing that I was disheartened with more than anything was the sword training. Mm-hmm. Sure. Like all the. All the techniques and all that crap. Like, I can learn how to fight in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, right? Sure, like hand-to-hand-wise. Yeah. I mean, yeah. the the weapons training was the most valuable, I thought. Right. So when I when I found Lucas and I and was training under his program, and Mugairu is, it's about 500 years old. It's a 500-year-old system, so it's got wow. some provenance to it. Yeah. They, they teach it in a manner or form as if it were battlefield orientated. Right. Um, they still do have the, the the kata, if you will, or the forms that you have to follow. Um, I was I was going to go and test for Shodan, which is like black belt version, um, and then COVID mm-hmm. hit. You know, there mm-hmm. went everything there. Stupid so, COVID. Um, and 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 what's interesting is, <clears throat> you know, and and the big difference between like uh, Americanized stuff and like traditional jujitsu or traditional system stuff is there's not a lot that you have to learn. Right. So there's only I think it's only seven forms or whatever that you had to learn for this sword system. Okay. For showdown level at least. Okay. But they have to be perfect. Mm. Uh, it's the perfection of it. Yeah. That gets you every like your hands, your fingers, your yep. placements, your movements have to be one hundred percent perfect. Yep. Yeah, a lot of minutia. It's it it is perfection. Yeah. Even the pace in what you in which you sword draw has to be wow. perfect. Everything. Mm-hmm. That's kind of how the black belt test is going right now for Master Sowers. Like, Brett, when he's been practicing it and doing it and drilling it, he has to have his hands in the right spot. Mm-hmm. If his foot isn't turned the right way, that's docked a point. Like, things like that. Yeah. So, so it's that's, wild. So imagine that, but... Also with a whip. But mm-hmm. imagine that, but saying your fingers are too wide. Oh, my God. <laughs> how particular. I don't think it yeah. matters how wide your fingers are when you're in a fight. With the drawing of a sword, there is a... a you know, so like when you draw a sword, there's even okay. angles to your, your <laughs> wrist, right? Mm-hmm. This has to be in your elbow. So everything has to be perfect as you as you follow through. That makes sense. And the pace of it and everything. Mm-hmm. Um, 
So, and I really enjoyed it because it, again, it's a, it's a different level of focus. Now, mm -hmm. if I've always said, like, if I were to go and venture and, and like go out into the woods, you know, I'm going to carry two things with me. One is a sword and two is my 45, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, would I feel confident enough to take on like a black bear if I had a sword? I don't know. Just for right. safekeeping, I would probably shoot him with a forty-five. Yeah. yeah. Now the chances that a black bear is going to actually attack you pretty low because they just want to take care of themselves and their babies, right? Yeah. But there are wolves and stuff out there. Right. Mm -hmm. Generally, they want to leave you alone too. But you know, again, would I feel comfortable attacking another animal if I had a sword, even with the training? I don't know. Right. Better to just shoot him with a forty-five. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. It is a stronger weapon. So it's a sword fight. Why would you bring that if you would just for the fun of it? Okay. <laughs> There's a certain style that comes with a sword. <laughs> you know, I, I just, I, I don't know. Wolves um, look at a sword and they're like, nah, not that guy. But uh, there, I mean, you, you, you could always use a sword in, in the woods. I mean, if you're right. up brush it's a tool or whatever. It's a in tool. general. Exactly. It's a tool. Not only just a weapon. Yeah. Um, just like anything. I say that a lot of times people say, why would you learn something like that? And then I always bring that back to them. Do you own a hammer? Mm -hmm. And they say, yes. And I say, well, people have used hammers to murder people. Sure. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And then they're like, and I'm like, everything's a tool. Depends on how you want to use it. Sure. Yeah. Depends yeah. If you're using it for what it's intended for or not. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, that, that, out, that branches into a little bit even more of a you know, a deep discussion, like weapons and martial arts, right? Right. So, and this right. is where I, I have a very, very controversial opinion on this. Okay. And and this is not going to go well, but is it is in in my opinion, <laughs> right. in my, my opinion, <laughs> that if you are not training in weapons, if you are not trying to become proficient in weapons, you're in a different world. I'll just say this: you're in a different world of martial arts. Yeah. Okay. Martial arts is a holistic battlefield orientated system. Okay, that's weapons and hand to hand. Right. Mm -hmm. So that, that, that's what martial arts is. If you're not training martial arts, so martial means, you know, military like, right. And there's right. no military in the world that doesn't conduct themselves without weapons. Mm -hmm. That's true. And art is your expression. Right. So that's what martial arts is. It's a military like expression. Yeah. So that's cool. Cause yeah, I've always talked about like the art side of how we're expressing what we're mm -hmm. learning technique wise, mm -hmm. but not really dived into the, the martial part of yep. the term. Mm -hmm. Martial means military like. That makes sense. So if you're if you're you know doing systems and stuff without weapons, you're 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 doing martial arts in a different way. I'll just say it that way. Yeah. Now, if you want to be a modern day martial artist, like you, I could very easily say Ellie is a, a very much so a modern day martial artist. Why? Because she's proficient in shooting guns, mm -hmm. right? Right. And when I say you know being proficient at weapons, that doesn't mean the sword or the knife or whatever the oh, hell it is. Be, be, be proficient at something because. Mm -hmm. It is a tool that is going to enhance your capabilities mm -hmm. as, as an individual. That's what they're there for. Right. Right. And when you go into a military-like situation, you're going to want to know how to use that tool. Yeah. Why? Because if I decide to attack you at a bar, I'm going to take a glass and smash it over your face. That's my weapon. That is your weapon now. So what do you got? Yeah. Hmm. Yep. Just my hands and my forearms. Right. <laughs> and the guard. And that doesn't, that doesn't very, you know, a lot of those things don't actually work real well. But that <laughs> yeah. That's crazy. But yeah. it, it's, it, you know, so being able to holistically handle yourself in a realistic world environment, right? Mm -hmm. If you're not training in weapons, then you don't know how to conduct yourself in that world. So what is that world? The bar, the grocery store, the mm -hmm. parking lot. There are weapons all about you in all of those environments. So like if you train in, so I've trained in combative systems too. One of the first things they talk about is, you know, understanding your environment and what are the first, what are the first points of weaponry that you're going to take if things go bad? Yeah. Right. So there's a very, there's a, a kind of a, a I don't know if you guys recall this. There was an incident in, I think it was in the UK, where the, those terrorists, like, they took over that bus and they had knives that were taped to their hands and yes. they killed all those people. Yes. And they actually stormed into a restaurant. Yep. And there was one guy in that restaurant that took on all three of those individuals. Whoa. But he took on, he tried to grab whatever he could 
to take on those three individuals while the other 25 people ran, ran out away. the back door. He held off those three individuals. He got cut up pretty bad. Yeah, I do but he that. handled he handled those three individuals. Mm-hmm. But he did so because he had stuff around him that he could use. That he could use, right? So when I talk about there's real evil shit and there's real evil people in the world, that's an example of it. And if you think that that evil person is going to conduct themselves within the rules of the mat, you're fooling no yourself. Mm-hmm. Right. So train yourself in in the realities of the matter. For all scenarios that could possibly happen, yeah. You can do a lot of things with a chair. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, chairs are used to fend off lions, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> For real, though. Yeah. yeah. I've thought about that quite often, that like... Just being on the ground is fine, but if you're on your feet, like if something were to happen, that's why I, it, I like training Muay Thai because mm-hmm. then that gives me like that extra step. Not saying I would be 100% safe on my feet, mm-hmm. but at least I have that extra step versus someone else yep. who doesn't it's train. It's another thing. Yeah. Yeah. And if you learn like real judo, if you can hit somebody with the planet, mm-hmm. yeah. you're going to, you're probably going to be better off than they are. Right. Yeah. So speaking of hitting someone with the planet we were at 55 so <laughs> Dai, Daito Rayu is a very traditional system so Daito Rayu then transitioned into what's called Daiko, Daito Rayu Aiki Jitsu and then from Daito Rayu Aiki Jitsu Aikido formulated okay, okay. so yeah. Aikido does have some very traditional foundations it all started with Daito Rayu now there they there is a, a gentleman his name is Nagao sensei in japan that does have a school still that trains and teaches in daito ryu he doesn't have a lot of students because not a lot of people can handle the training okay okay so what is the training involved the training is battlefield orientated fighting that's what daito ryu is so the throws that they do are meant to are meant to destroy you okay yeah and not a lot of people nowadays can handle that so he doesn't have a whole lot of students that are willing to put themselves through it but I will tell you this. I would not want to face one of those individuals. No way. Right. I mean, these are guys that literally know what it feels like and, and know how to destroy another human being. Mm-hmm. Okay? They're, so, like in judo, there are particular throws that they do in judo. I also know the additions to those throws that are used in Daito Ryu to destroy that person. Mm. Okay? They're, they're, they are, judo does water down their throws from what the traditions were. Wow. Right. Okay. For like probably the Olympics and sporting reasons, right? Yeah. And to continue training, and just you know exactly <laughs> to be able to continue training, but body hardening is part of it. Well, I've even seen that video; it kind of circulates around the internet where there's an adult. He's probably about your guys' size, and he takes probably a six or seven year old, mm-hmm. and he just like takes him from his shoulder and just whips him all <laughs> the way down, the back and forth, back I'm and forth. Sure that kid died. Times. Poor guy. Did he? That kid died. Oh really? My God. Yeah. I wouldn't be surprised. Well, he got up and he was just fine. And I was like, that wasn't a dummy. Like, that was a kid. He might die heck? later. <laughs> yeah. Oh, my God. I don't <laughs> know that I would go that far. <laughs> but that's what, that's what yeah. I'm thinking about when you're saying, like, they're meant to intentionally kill you. And I'm yeah. like, these throw, that throw was crazy. So, like, the traditional dojos, so they, they were um, what are they, they're called natural dojos. So, what did that what does that mean? So, they didn't have mats like this, right. dummy mats like this. Their mats were organic. You know, they, you know grass? the Tommy mats were made of oh, you know, woven grass oh, okay, and organic. Yeah. They were, that, that was their mat, right? Because that was <laughs> as soft as they could find back. You know, 500 years ago, they yeah. didn't have mats. Right. Okay? Yeah, so what did they have to do? Sunflower field they or had to <laughs> wolf things together to formulate mats, okay? So mm-hmm. I don't believe Nagao Sensei trains with the woven mat or the, the traditional mats anymore. I think he has modern day mats, but he still trains in the modern, in the old system, okay? And so natural dojo, what's a natural dojo? That means natural to the environment of the day. Oh. Okay. So if we were in a natural dojo right now, we'd be, the temperature, what's the temperature outside? 25 degrees? Yeah. yeah. We'd be That's sitting at 25 training. degrees right now. Ooh. Because in war, the temperature doesn't yeah. adjust itself right. for war. Right. Right. Okay. So that's a natural, that's how these guys train. They train depending on the environment of the day. And you didn't just, uh, I'm not going to show up today because it's cold outside. Yeah. No. Yeah. There's no walls. And maybe there's a roof. Yeah, yeah. There was a roof. Yeah, there was a roof, but it was still a natural dojo. They call it natural dojo. That makes sense. It was the environment of the day. Mm-hmm. So, I, and that's how these guys trained. And to say you know there wasn't some validity to that level of training, I think is a, you know a, a stretch. Yeah. 
But uh, anyway. Yeah, but I mean, that used to be training for the battlefield. Yes, and there, you know, it, you know, snow is not going to hold off because you know, well, we want to go to battle today, or all right, mm-hmm. we're going to check the weather. You know, you know, six hundred years ago, they didn't have weather map and meteorology, right. so you wake it's up, look like, at the sky. All right, is it going to rain today? I don't know, guys. Maybe we'll just wait till tomorrow. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there was none of that. We are very privileged nowadays. Yes. It's crazy how everything has changed so much. Like even just jujitsu, it was it's only been around for a hundred years. So when you said that, what was it that you were talking about? Was it around for five hundred? Well, can't... that was Mugairu. Yeah, that was five hundred years. So like word. traditional, <laughs> traditional, like traditional systems, like traditional jujitsu systems, have been around for a thousand years. So that was the mm-hmm. Japanese stuff. Yeah. Whereas Brazilian jujitsu is only like a hundred years right. old, which is crazy. And there's there's even older systems too. Um, uh, is it tension? I've, forgot how to enunciate it, but it's, um, I've been reading about it a little bit more, but it was formulated in, in China. And, you know, there's been systems in China that have been around 5,000 years, you know, wow. and to <laughs> say, to say, you know, and, and you can say whatever you want about, you know, Kung Fu and whatever else, but to say, to say that there aren't things in those systems that don't have, that have, that are without validity, it might be a stretch. I mean, so I, I, again, I forgot the name of the system. I have I have books on it, and I have uh, what are called densho, which are secret books of it at home. But mm-hmm. in order to get Menki Okaidan rank in that system, you're gonna know a lot of stuff. All right, a lot of different systems. And and then when you get Menki Okaidan rank or the highest rank, you are handed a, a glass jar of eyeballs. Oh my god. That are actual eyes that were removed from human beings I don't think during one on one fighting. Say that. <laughs> wow. Because one of the dis- one of the discreet things, one thing is that is there very well known in that system is how to very efficiently remove your eye. Wow. Is that why eye gouging is not allowed anymore? <laughs> <laughs> well, there's eye gouging and then there's eye removing, right? So it's different. <laughs> there's a, there's a, and it comes and I'll just say it because I really don't care about secrets anymore. But it comes through <laughs> from the nose side of the eye to get curled and popped out. Oh, wow. You can remove a person's eye very easily. That's crazy. Well, I hope to never try to do that. No, and I've never heard of that. So yeah. that's why. I, like, you did this, and I did not expect you to say eyeballs. Yes. <laughs> yeah. You were handed a jar of eyes that are one in real one-on-one combat. Whoa. Yeah, I can only imagine if we, like, went back in time 5,000 years ago and said, hey, you should start preparing for war that looks like <laughs> where we come from. <laughs> They'd be like, yeah, there'd be no comparison for them. But then also looking back. There'd be no comparison for us to understand why they made the things that they made. Sure, mm-hmm. sure. It's it's you know historical environment, right? Yeah. yeah, just different time, different place. You know, you, you, even my dad, when you, you know you look at like the military today, right? Right. Like, these guys are armored up, and they go into battle. You know, my dad jokes like he had, a, he had a flak jacket mm. when he went into the the jungle in Vietnam. They had no armor. Yeah. They had a flak jacket. You know what he used that flak jacket for? Use it for a pillow. Yeah. Wow. He said it was. That's about the value of it. Mm. That's crazy. It was maybe good enough for stopping a knife at best. Mm. Yeah. So I did want to just ask you, as someone who's done traditional and a bunch of other martial arts mm-hmm. on top of Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, you're now a brown belt in Jiu Jitsu. So what is the biggest difference between traditional versus Brazilian? So again, tra- weapons. Yeah, <laughs> traditional Jiu Jitsu focuses on battlefield oriented tactics. Um, it is. It is more stand up. Um, and it is, it is meant to efficiently destroy a human being. That is the mindset and that's how you're taught, especially in Kukishinru. It is, it is incredible. Some of the stuff that they teach in Kukishinru, it is most efficiently used to, it, it is a system to teach you how to efficiently destroy a human being. In from yeah from stand up from the ground from right, anywhere right with anything so in Brazilian jiu jitsu like I I can't rip your eyes out in Brazilian jiu jitsu right? you can do it once um, <laughs> uh, so uh, hapo ken hapo ken hapo means empty cave okay what is hapo ken it's when I take my hands on either side of your ears and I smack your ears oh yeah, it's called hapo ken because what happens when you do that is vacuum imagine. from your hands hitting your ear creates an empty cave. Yeah. That's why they call it hapoken. Bunk. So you can't do that in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. <laughs> you can do it once. <laughs> <laughs> you, want, you can do it once. So it's stuff like that, right? Mm-hmm. You know, th- there are there are particular pressure points, particular things, particular particular grip, oh, particular yeah. way yeah. to grab things. Yeah, and you've you've shown that when you did 
teach that class for a little bit. I do showed, remember like, showing pressure points. Where you're putting your pressure to make people move certain ways yeah. to open up certain techniques mm-hmm. that you're using in today's traditional sport, jujitsu. Right. Now, but, what is... But that, that can be extrapolated further sure. into, like, destroying people's sure. ability to move or continue to fight. Or, sure. So what is the value of Brazilian jiu-jitsu, right? If there's this in this traditional stuff out there. Well, in yeah. the traditional jiu-jitsu world, they don't get into, you know, realistic fighting, if you call it. Right? Like hand-hand fighting? Or they don't get into, like, practicing practice mode. Like, we roll, right? Yeah. There's no rolling in traditional jiu-jitsu. You sure. do your katas, you do a little bit of waza here and there, but you don't, yeah. they call it knee waza, right? You do a little bit of that, but it's not like what we do in Brazilian jiu-jitsu yeah. where Cause we, can't, we, like, hurt we, go, we go after, we go at it. Right, mm-hmm. we keep if we want to, we can go at it, and right. and there's that's the the difference because you gain a level of comfort in your capability with respect to how you can handle yourself and handle other people of varying different sizes, right? And you get to actually feel what that feels like. Yeah, and go through it in and a go real through life it scenario. and be exhausted, be absolutely you know being exhausted with Joe Hosh on top of you while he's about <laughs> to freaking armbar you. And looking at the clock, and I experienced this, was that two weeks ago, Joe? <laughs> Where I'm looking at the clock like, oh, I got 30 seconds. Oh, I don't know if I can do this or not. Yeah. <laughs> and you got this big dude on top, and you're like, oh, my God, I'm just, you're, I was exhausted when I started with him. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then you're four minutes in, and it's like, I'm dead. Yeah. Yes. And still to, like, try and pull through that, mm-hmm. it's, it's yeah. important. It's a whole really different important. mindset in itself. It's a whole different mindset. Yeah. So nowadays, what are you training? Is it just jujitsu you train? You have plans to train more? So I'm uh, right now. I'm 100 percent focused on Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. Um, mm-hmm. I know you competed at Worlds IBJJF yep, last year. Worlds. I'm I'm gonna do Chicago. Um, mm-hmm. So that we'll see what happens there. Hopefully, we can compete again at Worlds this year. We'll yeah, see. Yeah, I'd like to go to Worlds again. Well, I, I think we had a lot of fun. I yeah. think we had a lot of fun. I, yeah, we had a lot of fun. So so. Chicago is uh, May 14th or 15th or okay. something like that. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, I'm only training in Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. Um, I've thought about doing personal training, like my own personal uh, training again of knife fighting, um, because I still have all the techniques and all that stuff written down and, and, yeah. and whatnot. So, and I, and I, he has, so I bought, so I won his set of CDs when I was at his camp. So he has CDs that shows you all the stuff that you, so I can just watch the CDs and just refresh myself. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And go through it. Once you've learned it. it and you can see it again, then it's just refresh yourself. And right. Just cleaning right. things up again, right? Um, I, you know, I'm thinking about going back in the sword again. We'll see. But for me, you know, guys, you know, if you want to know how to take care of yourself in the realistic world, it's grappling. Mm-hmm. I don't care if you know wrestling. I don't care if you know judo. I don't care if you know sambo. I don't care if you know Brazilian jiu-jitsu. It's grappling. Mm-hmm. So me, in my mind right now, I'm not focused, you know, and I, I don't want to say I'm not focused on Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu because that's what I, that's the only area I train in. But my focus or my mindset is to be a good grappler. Yeah. Just to be a grappler. Mm-hmm. That's it. That makes sense. So are you more so focusing on being a self-defense grappler or are you trying to work on like the point system for IBJJF and I could call for stalling? <laughs> Sports or self defense, I guess. Well, yeah. this is there's a, there, those are yeah. both good grapplers, right? It kind of depends which way you want to play it. Well, you know, fuck IBJJ. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm not going to focus on that. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to think about it, but I'm not going to focus on it. And why is that? Because if I focus on the point system, when reality hits, right? You know, points don't matter. And in you know, there, again, self defense. I don't, I don't train self defense. I train self offense. Okay. Okay. So people always talk about the the. You know, the championships are won through defenses, right? Sure. Right? Yeah. What are those defenses doing that allows them to win? They're attacking the ball. What is that? That's offensive. Yeah. There's still an offensive aspect to it. Yeah. So it, 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 I don't train self-defense only because I believe that if you train self-defense, you're already putting yourself in a position mm-hmm. mentally where you're and you're you're catching up. You're you're on the rebound or you're, you're, yeah. you're already you're on already in the you're on the backside of, of where you should be. Yeah. I train self offense, meaning I'm I'm ready for you, buddy. That's true. I feel like that's what really turns a blue belt to a purple belt mm-hmm. is being able to even in defensive um least dominant positions, you can the way you get out of there is by attacking yes. and making them start to defend even though they're in a superior position. 
once you can really do that, I think you're an established, at least purple belt. Yep. So like the combatives world, um, you know, Krav Maga world, that's where they really focus. They don't focus mm. on self-defense. They focus on more of a self-offense mindset. And, and you know, and again, those, those two worlds, if you will, they're very destructive. They're very aggressive. They're very mm-hmm. emotional. And that's, that's, you know, emotional charged action, uh, you know, in, in the environment to, to overcome your opponent. Sure. To, to mess up what they call their OODA loop, right? You know, just kind of their way. What? Of, their OODA loop. I love that word. <laughs> <laughs> it's an acronym for something that I always forget what it is. But OODA loop. Um, it basically is to mess up their well, their, their state of being. Sure. Right? So, so they can't follow if, through with if, whatever yeah, they're trying you, to do. All you need is that split One second. Moment. And then my eye's gone. Yep. <laughs> and then it's, it's going to be in a jar of other eyeballs. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, is there any last minute things that maybe we didn't get to that you wanted to talk about? Yeah, I know we jumped around a bit oh, in the yeah. episode, but I really did like it. Well, yeah, I mean, there's a lot of different, th- a lot <laughs> yeah. of different things. Lots of things you've about. experienced in your life. And- yeah. There's so much backstory and history to everything, too, but it was really cool to hear perspectives that we are not familiar with. Like, oodle loop. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> No, it was super cool having you on. So thank you. Yeah. I really yeah, appreciate. Thank you for having me. I, I hope uh, at least some of what I had to, uh, had to say offered some value. Yeah, definitely. Um, if you have to disagree with me, I I respect I respect your opinion. I just you know this is where I am at. So. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Whatever. As millennials <laughs> say, it's your truth. Oh, is that what is that where, is that where we're going with? <laughs> that's, yeah. what it's, that's, that's what it's truth? called. It's your truth. It's not about your. It's not about the truth. It's about your truth. Your right? truth. Okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah. But no, it's cool because you have obviously <laughs> a bunch of wisdom and experience that a lot of people cannot compare to. So it was yeah. cool. Cool. Yeah. Different perspective. So. Yeah. And yeah. That's good. So. Well, thanks, thanks guys so. for yep. listening. Thanks and for listening. thanks again, Jason. Yep. Appreciate sure. it. And, and I'm at fluid Mondays and and Mondays and sometimes Thursdays and stuff. So yes. If any yes. Other, you're teaching Whatever. tomorrow, right? I am yeah, teaching Yeah, he's tomorrow. teaching Monday class tomorrow night. Fluid should, people, I, should, I, you know. should I divulge what I'm teaching? Or? Sure. Yeah. De- De La Eva. Oh, yes. De La Eva tomorrow. Mm-hmm. Fantastic. Which is an awesome guard. So. It really is. Ian is there for you because Ian loves that. Does he? But yes. <laughs> All right. Have a good weekend. Thanks, guys.